Uh, the reason for the legislation before council the last time was because uh, we wanted to have in place those designated underground areas for purposes of control, um, and then we'll adopt the regular legislation once the uh, once we know what it is in its final form. We'll go into our uh, into our code. Okay. The only other um, thing that came to council that I think would be of interest to planning commission at some point is the housing initiative. And there was just a report basically that uh, we were in the process of having the community conversations on housing. I just left the third one uh, and we'll have the fourth on the 21st and then we'll compile the, all the data from that. And, and I'm going to request um, that uh, at a future meeting soon, Planning Commission, that we have a discussion on what potentially pieces of any housing initiative Planning Commission would be involved in and what Planning Commission wouldn't be involved in, particularly what Planning Commission might be involved in. But that, that's for the future. Other than that, there was uh, a report on infrastructure needs like sewer, water, street, sidewalk, like that, uh, pool repairs, um, and oh, I'm a lot of concept. Thank you. Um, okay, now uh, um, is citizens' comments. Um, if there's any citizens here who would like to discuss something that's not on the agenda, this is the time. Do I need to open up the public hearing? A public hearing is just for your for your actual okay. public hearings. Okay. This is just if anyone wants to. Thank you. Okay. Um, so now we're going to have a public hearing on our first conditional use application. Um, so Sorry, I've been sick for a week, <laughs> so my brain's a little fuzzy. Um, you want to sure. start this off? Sure. Um, as all of you know, uh, Jay Cromit, uh, Trail Town Brewing, uh, was here uh, last meeting or February, February meeting um, to get approval for a brewery at the uh, former uh, Williams Eatery location at 101 Quarry Street. Um, he um, has delays due to a lot of things he has to fix up, uh, and you might give us a little report on that if you want. Um, but uh, in the meantime, uh, the, he is partnered with uh, Red Pepper, Fly Flying Pepper, um, it's a Mexican themed food truck. Uh, that is actually going to be preparing the menu inside the restaurant. Yeah, they will be the kitchen of the restaurant. Okay, and so what he wants to do in the meantime, because you know he is in a lease agreement and he's spending a lot of money, um, is could he at least um, have a food truck um, on the lot to introduce the community to this menu? And that is what he's here for tonight. And Jake, you want to come forward and maybe explain a little bit more detail? Sure. <coughs> Yeah, the, uh, the actual building that we're uh, working with right now, um, we found that after having different inspections that there's a lot of stuff on the code. The Ansel system, they changed the laws on the Ansel system last year, and it was never brought up to code. So as soon as we took over the lease, there's no grandfather clause for the, for the fire Ansel system. So that has to replace, be replaced. Um, along with the ductwork connecting to the into the hood, you know, 10, 12 years that had never been cleaned. Or, you know, if you have a piece of metal ductwork, it probably you know, 10 foot weighs maybe five pounds. Well, 10 foot weighed what, 50 pounds because of all the grease that was still in there. It never been the person had been cleaning. It only cleaned from the hood down, nothing from the hood out to the vent. So. Uh, Fly Pepper has replaced that stuff and they're doing that Ansel system. Um, and then on the inside of the building, the main, the, what had been the main room, the floor over years of just something being on there. It wasn't the sinks leaking, it was something that was actually physically in there, like a cooler or something. It had leaked for years and years. And the floor, every time somebody's gone into that place 
they just put a new floor over the old floor. So I ripped up, you know, six inches of warped floors and, and we're in the process of putting that back down and um, still waiting for the roof to be replaced. We had to order the, that, you know, the greenhouse roof. It's like a trampoline material. We had to order that and you know, replace that. Um, now, even though we, originally we were going to do the brewery on the outside, in the, but the county said we couldn't do it. We have to put a, a permanent roof on it. We have to replace the flooring with concrete and everything else. So if we move that to the inside, which was already considered a restaurant, which is the same, the same type of, of uh, business, then the other part as a dining would be grandfathered in. We wouldn't have to do any anything on that room. So um, even though we weren't doing a change of use, they still they hadn't had new plans in 10, 12 years. So we're now having to have an architect come in like we were going to have to do if it was a change of use. Now we're having to have it done just for just to get the occupancy. So we're behind a few months. Um, probably be two more before we actually get the you know plumbing and electric or whatever done. So in that time frame, we'd like to have their food truck, which what would, would be 23 feet? It's like 23 feet long, nine feet wide. And I, I gave Denise a diagram. But we'd like to back that thing up into the corner of the two fences. So the fence that is at the arts building, and then, and then the one that's back to the alley that faces Peaches. Back it up into that area with the front you know, sticking forward. And that way the window would be into that into our actual parking lot and uh, and it you know it's like 40 feet off the road so it's plenty of space and we'd like to have that there um, and able to sell stuff there until we get the kitchen until we get there you know the occupancy and get the, get the kitchen running and then once it's on the inside then once the kitchen's run on the inside then we really don't have to worry about it um, the only other thing would be is I don't if there's any possibility of being there like on the street fair. So that's what we're looking to do. We're trying to get some money coming in. We've got a lot going out, and uh, yeah. you know I've paid I just paid you know four months of rent and the security deposit of five months of rent basically, and we barely turned a screw in there really to change stuff. But, so we're trying to. And, and the food truck, it will be leaving every night. Every single night. Yeah, there's, there's there. too much equipment on there for her to leave it anywhere other than her house. Right. Um, and there will be no trash left on premises. All their water is contained, the gray water, everything is contained in the truck. So when they leave at night, you won't even, you won't even know it was there. <coughs> Any questions from the applicant? Any questions The only question I had, and I guess this is maybe for the applicant, is the drawing he did, is it sort of off? Isn't the patio more at the side of the building, I guess? No, the patio is behind the greenhouse part. It sticks out probably the... Oh, the patio is behind the greenhouse. Yeah, the, the gotcha. patio sticks out like yeah. six or eight feet into the parking lot. That's how okay. I got the parking lot drawn. Okay, that little... now I understand, because I was thinking that was the greenhouse. I guess. <laughs> Even though it says patio. Thank you. Right. And he called the greenhouse temp building. Yes, yes I yeah. see. Which is technically what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so I found out. <laughs> um, the GPS picture is very nice. It pretty much has uh, something parked there. That oh, it did? Very yeah. simple I, didn't, I didn't even there. see that. Probably just as big as what as a food truck. Yeah. Oh, um, um, so do we have to make a decision about street fair? Why would there be a difference on street fair day about letting him park it? Well, this isn't going to be like a temporary thing that mm -hmm. has a beginning and an end when he opens up. If he wants to also do it on street fair, that would be something that happens. Would, would the food truck be in that same place for street fair? Yeah, I assume so. I mean, it's. I mean, the street's not being used. So I don't know if you still want it that 40 feet off, like 
if it was used, you know, as an entrance, that street's going to be closed for street fare, but, it, you know, it doesn't matter if it's there or if it's parked closer up for, for visual. I don't see any reason why it couldn't be there. I mean, if yeah. we say it can be there, why wouldn't it be? It's essentially you're using it as your temporary restaurant. Right. right. I guess, I mean, it follows the same rules. It'd have to be there, you know, what, before 7 o'clock in the morning and then gone by 6 o'clock after a little fair, right? So whatever papers. Well, well, I know. I mean, we would, it's on private property and you wouldn't yeah, have to be gone by 6 o'clock. Yeah, it's only the would, stuff on the street. On the street. Yeah. Yeah. You, would, you would just have to follow the rules that we give you today. Oh, all right. Oh. So as long as it's gone, they're not there overnight. Yeah. yeah. That sounds good. Well, I guess it seems fine to me. Does anyone have any concerns? I would only suggest that you don't put a time limit on it. If you're asking for approvals, you want approval to put a food truck on your line. Right. And that's okay. It. So as far as I'm concerned, you should keep it that way and okay. let it be done. Whatever <laughs> <laughs> is easier for you. Yeah. So yeah, because, um, like, I don't remember exactly what uh, hours we approved for the brew pub. Uh, 11 to 10. Okay, so it's not okay. any less. Seven uh, days a week, yeah. 11 to 10, yeah. Okay. Do we want to have a motion? Mm -hmm. Can you do a public hearing? We have an open day. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I do open the public hearing. Any public would like to make a comment about this? And hearing none, close the public hearing. Thank you so much, Ted. Bring you back up here. Well, I'm going to make a motion to approve the conditional use permit uh, for uh, the Trail Town Brewing at 101 Quarry Street, uh, which is approving the mobile vending food truck and it's the excuse me I don't remember the name the flying pattern yes um, I don't I don't know that you necessarily want to attach a Same name, name. You just say the food, food truck great right. a food truck yeah okay and should I say during their no I shouldn't say any hours just that Second. Okay. Everyone comfortable with the motion? Rose, do you want to call for the roll call? Are you, are you ready to do that? Don't you need to? Will you just okay. call, say go ahead and call the roll? Oh, we'll go ahead and call the roll. Please. You want to jump in? <laughs> All right, Styles. Yes. Doden. Yes. McQueen? Yes. Denel? Yes. Posa? Yes. Great. It sounds like it's going to look beautiful, I think you do. I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> Spending a lot of money. That's for sure. I would say, on the record, I would suggest that you coordinate with the chamber on when you can get the food truck in there for street fair because when they close the streets. If you're not there, you're not there. <laughs> <laughs> Little worth of dice. Yeah. All right. So we're going to move on to our text amendments. Thank you. Guys. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you want to okay. take over? Yes. Okay. We have uh, quite a few text amendments tonight. They're um, more of the simple ones. Uh, save the, the more complex ones in discussion. Um, but first I wanted to introduce very quickly um, Michaela Grant. Um, she's a Wright State University intern. Um, she's been working with me since January uh, out in the political science department and she has helped me in researching some of these text amendments. All right, let's get started. <clears throat> now we're going to um, need to have a public hearing on each of these individually, correct? So we'll do one at a time. Okay, the first one, 102004 maintenance requirements. 
is simply, um, as you recall, we uh, were asked by council to look at the weed ordinance, which is also outside of the zoning code um, earlier uh, last year or sometime. And um, what, in going through something else, looking at right of way ordinances, I found this uh, in 102004 maintenance requirements for public right of ways, and I just wanted to keep the standard the same. Um, which we had changed it from 12 inches to 9 inches, right? Plant growth, woody, non woody, plant growth. And that. So. Sorry, um, okay, so. Open a public hearing. Close okay. a public hearing. Uh, open a public hearing. Uh, close a public hearing. Any discussion up here about this change? Make a motion we approve it. Well, no, no I have a discussion item, but it's not really about. So go ahead. I mean, I, well, I'm okay since I started talking. <laughs> Number C talks about maintaining good condition to the original grade, blah, 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 blah. Well, I live on West Davis Street in the older part of town, so technically, I have to be out of the sidewalk, so technically, I guess the village owns up some portion of that property. And I guess it's an it's a issue question that I'm raising. When I moved there, I had no idea that part of that property was actually owned by the village and that there was supposed to be a swale there. The swale is still there, I haven't done anything with it, but my neighbors, have planted things a lot, you know, I think filled it in. So I think I don't think people understand in especially in the older part of town or places where there are where there are swales that the village itself owns part of that property or at least has a, a, an easement, whatever it is, and that they need to be maintaining it. And I think that there should be some kind of education, maybe when people buy a house, the realtors should tell people. I mean, maybe we should. Have, well, some of the people need to know. Otherwise, people just fill in the swales or plant trees. I think I could probably planted a tree too close. And I'm sure I did. I planted a couple trees too close. So I, I don't know the. Answer. Well, I mean, you know, that's kind of a broader discussion for us too, because um, one of the things we were talking about in active transportation planning too is possibly not allowing people to plant things in the right of way because of possible future expansion of uh, multi-purpose uh, walkways, bike paths, or path, pedestrian pathways. So that might be something that we'll look at in the future. That doesn't obviously okay. answer what's existing, but as you probably all are aware with the rain that we've had and uh, the, the public works has had quite a mess with storm the storm system and part of that has been due to you know maintenance issues things that get down there people need to take care of some things so um that might be more of you know this is outside of the yeah it, outside it's outside of the zone maybe part of the comprehensive plan could be like a new owner um education packet you know like that has things that you should be aware of all in one spot. I mean, I'm sure you do get those yeah. calls like, hey, like, what should I be aware of? That would be, you know, what are you required to do on your right of way kind of thing. Well, when you purchase a property, you get a, you have to have a survey as a part of the fee exchange. So on that survey, the corner pin should be located. Yeah. And identifying you as a new owner of a property, where that property line is and where the right of way starts, and what's on I think we can have a survey. And in fact, you know, in fact, the people who live beside me, their realtor told them that 20 feet of my property was their property. And they hadn't thought that until I moved in. Well, then how did they know that without a survey? Because I had Richard Zopp come over. And uh, when I was looking at my property, I thought it was sort of off. And Richard Zopp came over and said, oh, your property is up here. I mean, I, in my business, it, every single deed recorded is required to have a, a survey as part of that deed you mean, report. You mean a new survey? Sur yeah. Sur I mean, no. it's got to be. I don't think that happened. I, I didn't happen. 
if the I mean, pins are there, it's not. I can't fun. imagine that the title company would release it without that survey. Chris, my, I mean, I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I've never heard of that. That you can't, you know, that you can just exchange property but, without. Particularly if you have a mortgage. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I always. But, but having the knowledge of, um, I don't know, just like, uh, like our mowing ordinances and stuff like that all in one place. I don't know. Anyway. That's I, my, I mean, I understand what I'm yeah. bringing up is outside of this particular thing. Yeah. But I do think that there are a lot of people who don't understand these issues, including me. Well, I'm going to go ahead and second the motion. Cool. Uh, would you uh, call the roll, please? So, okay, I'm sorry. Switch pages. Oh. <clears throat> you know, I did catch something that I think is an error. Uh, let's see. We have a second on the motion. For this piece? Well, it's for. Are we voting just on? We're, voting we're only just voting on that one. Okay, we're not voting on nope. 35 feet there is a typographical error in that and it says side yard and it should be rear this is what I have a question about okay so at number three it says no side setback is required unless the side yard abuts a residential district in which case the minimum side yard of 15 feet should be provided along that side mm -hmm. number five says if the side yard abuts a residential district or a village boundary line, the setback of 30 feet shall be provided. So it seems like in one place it's saying the side yard abuts a residential district, it should have 15 feet, and then in, in number five it says it should have 30 feet. Am I not understanding Those something? Are to these. They only apply yeah. to so, so three applies to um, E1 and five applies to okay, thank E2. You. Wait a minute, what now? Wait a minute. It's I was reading, what I was reading was footnotes that are referenced up in that table. Right. And I didn't realize but, that. So in B1, Oh, it's, I see. Yeah, it's right. Exactly. Right. And right. 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 B2, yeah. it's yeah. 30. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so we're just changing. Yeah. And then in where 6 is for B2 rear, it should be um, rear instead of side on the footnote. We're just changing a little grammatical error on the footnote to B2 rear setback. Um, when it about the residential district, uh, open the public hearing, close the public hearing, and well, discussion. Motion. I move approval of the spatial requirements. Second. 
All the rules. Battles. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Canal. Yes. Duden. Yep. Bozo. Yes. 1264 uses accessory buildings and structures. Um, we have accessory structures shall not exceed 66% of the principal building's floor area or 800 square feet, whichever is less. Um, this came up recently um, when uh, I was figuring it for a structure that um, the uh, definition for gross floor area <coughs> is you take the sum of the horizontal area of the several floors. So you have to give credit for the several floors of that building to then meet that 66% or 800 square feet, whichever is less. And I wasn't doing that, I was doing it by the actual footprint. So by putting in gross floor area, it clarifies that better. Okay, um, uh, open the public hearing, close the public hearing. Um, so we're just adding the term gross in the floor area calculation for accessory structures. Move to accept the change. Second. Call the roll. Did you second? I did second. Is that all right? Yeah. Yep. Just want to put there on that. Um, McQueen? Yes. Yeah. Didn't. Yes. Doden? Yes. Stout? Yes. Tulsa? Yes. 126202 procedures uh, under B public notice. It is the planning and zoning administrator that takes care of all that part process of the application, not the clerk of council. So just changing that. That's why I'm responsible for notifying the property owners. Okay. Um, public hearing. Open the public hearing. Close the public hearing. Bring it back up to you guys. I move we make the change in public notice from clerk of courts to the planning and zoning administrator. I second that. Whenever you're ready. Dino. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Styles. Yes. Doden. Yes. Hosa. Yes. Okay. Um, as you recall, at the March meeting, we had a uh, someone asking about not having to put a microwave oven in an accessory dwelling unit. So just clarifying that in the code so that it can be and or uh, microwave oven and or stove and sink instead of both. Open the public hearing. Close the public hearing. Bring it back up to you guys. And I move that we uh, accept the change as written for 1262.08. Uh, Second. Doden? Yes. Styles? Yes. Canel? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Close Yes. Okay. <clears throat> 126603 permitted signs. Had a situation that came up, um, and it was uh, the Friends Care Center. Um, they want to have directional signs with internally within their property. They are signs that, that, that are would be larger than what you would normally see for what we what would be categorized as a directional sign, which is simply an arrow. They want to be able to identify the buildings, and it, it you know I had some discussions about this and and felt that. Um, if you can't see the sign from the street or other public property, if it's internal on, well, just saying what you have over at Millworks, <laughs> if, it's, if there are businesses internally there, then I, I would like to see us have an exemption to that. Otherwise, we're going to make them have to go through a variance process for that. What about abutting private property? Like, if um, I mean, I guess it's not really going to be a problem. So I, I'll open the public hearing, close the public hearing. Um, I would only make. I, I think that there could be a way of saying that um, signage that is in the front yard along the public right of way. Okay. 
as opposed to trying to get internal because there are many conditions, let's say date mailing, where along the public right away you can see the ground plan to identify the property. Within that, you may have tenants that you can't even see from the street. Doesn't matter, but once you get inside, it says delivery or it says um, emergency shelter or whatever it is, it's really not part of the way I look at it, unless it's illuminated. You know, so that it bothers the neighbor. No, I mean, in, in this case, they were like having like rehab unit is here and right. that is over here. Um, so was it for the public to see coming there? People that are pulling in yes. and going around. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's like any out How do we, you know, are we going to say that we're involved in every naming of every building and looking at the signage on every building? No. Just and, and because uh, you know those um, independent living facilities, it's still all one lot, yeah. so it's all under Friends Care Center. So how would you wordsmith that? Today? I would say that the the signage. I don't know how to word it, but the signage that is within the zoning code ordinance should should be relative to the front yard or public right-of-way signage, the entrance signage, building identification signage, not internal signage. So you had initially stated that, if I am understanding you correctly, if you change this to zoning administrator may exempt the maximum requirement of site visit during the location of the signs will uh, not be visible in the public yard or along the public right-of-way? Am I hearing you correctly? Well, no, I'd permit? say it within, it's got to be within the front yard or not. Because if it, once you get, to me, once you get past the front yard requirement, which is the building setback requirement, you're within that property relative to the buildings and what's ever the parking lot in the back or buildings in the back or whatever it is, and that's just outside our, our purview, I think. At least the way I interpret well, uh, so when we were writing this, you were on planning mission when we did the signs, right? Yes. Um, the maximum of three types of permitted signs and four total permitted signs per principal building shall be allowed. So. We allow one one additional sign per tenant when it was a multi-tenant building. But in the case of Friends Care, it's not. there's only one principal building on that property. It's it's, it's and it was just one tenant. I mean, yeah, Friends Care Center. Center. Um, I mean, I'm I'm still not seeing how you're not getting there if you just say. The location of the signs will be visible only in the public yard or along the public right away. If well, you, well, I'm sorry, the reverse. It will if, not be. Yeah. Yeah. If they're if they're not, not visible from the public yard or public right away, that you don't care about them, basically as well. Yeah. Because I think that language over here you have to mess around with the knots and put in public yard or public right away instead of street or public property. You've got it if I'm understanding what you're saying. Signs not visible from the public right of way or? Well, the definition of a ground sign or a building identification sign is within the front yard. It's located within the front yard. So that's why I think that this is, it, that's how I see it. And is that what ours says though? Does ours say within the front yard? I don't think it does. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're talking that we need a that's one clarification type, that's, that's one type of sign. clarification. But that but this would be a ground sign or a uh, freestanding sign. Yeah. They obviously have already have more signs than just three, four. And what they're signs. wanting is like a freestanding or a ground sign, not a sign on their wall. Mm -hmm. Yes. I guess I'm sort of agreeing. I understand Ted's wording, but I'm rather agreeing with Judy 
that it seems like what you have written actually is saying that, that it's not visible from the street or public property. Or, or you could add public or private property if that's the heartburn, because that was what Rose was pointing out. If the neighboring property can see the sign, do you have a, does that change it? Because what you're trying to address is that it's interior, yeah. and that would cover it, public or private. I can't think of any other kind of property. Yeah, I mean, illuminated signs should have, and I didn't honestly go through and look at all of the ordinance on the signage, but illuminated signs can't project light onto any adjacent property regardless. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. So illuminated signs aren't in an issue relative to where they are back on a site or even on the street. But that's the, that's the offense mm -hmm. that you're trying to prevent from a neighbor. Well, if you see a lot of text as well, even if it's not illuminated, like, I'm, I'm not talking about, like, I guess, like, the, the terrible thing that could happen, right, is if a neighbor pointed signs, not towards the public right of way, but towards their neighbor, right, and put up a bunch of signs, and they're like, well, signs not visible from the street or public property are exempt from ma maximum number requirements, then, like, that's what I'm, that's, I'm talking, I kind of feel like the one thing that planning, that development code tries to do is, like, neighborly, to, to not have is neighborly aggression, and I guess, like, signs are a really good way of, of doing neighborly aggression. <laughs> well, I, they would have to, that neighbor would have to go down and get a sign from and that sign permit would dictate the size of that sign relative to its location. Yeah, but they could have as many as they wanted if it wasn't um, visible from the street or public property. How it's written right now is what I'm saying. But what you said before about from the public right of way or abutting property, what? But I. Um, but I get what Ted is saying because it's good for you to click with me that it's only in the front lot line. So, but. I mean, the purpose, it goes back to purpose. The purpose of a sign for a building owner is to identify that building for the public who is looking for that building. Yeah. And to identify what that building is and what the purpose of that building is. Once you get into the property, then that sign may be directional to locate, for example, a friend's care, a, a, an apartment house, or the gym, or the whatever, it, yeah. within that public property. And that's what they're wanting to do, but they want to be able to do it on a ground freestanding sign. And I, see, I don't see why we would have any say in that whatsoever. Because I think that once you get past that front yard and public right of way, it's outside of our jurisdiction. So you're saying we don't even need a rule to address it? Yes, that's just, I think if there's not a clarification to that in our signage package, that's the way it should be clarified. Now, I may be wrong about that. I mean, I'll throw that to Chris, but, you know, that's, you know, I always go back to purpose. You know, what's the purpose of a sign? And that's, that's really what this ordinance is about. It's trying to dictate what this, the public sees. And, we, and these ordinances started to come up because of, all the sign pollution that you see when you drive down every street and you know in the public right of way it looks just ridiculous because it's all signs. <clears throat> but if you so if they have a sign internally or one of their streets internally and and they have uh, they have illuminated then they're using I mean how's Green County going to know if there's no notification process from us whether it meets code or not. Yeah, because I mean anything electric has to go to Green County. Well, you know, have to have wind loading and things <coughs> like that, but I, that's on the owner. That's not, that's outside the public right of way. So again, that's on the owner. Well, it, it seems to me that would become an enforcement issue if they put it up and we right. it's discovered. Yeah. Well, the way the code is now, I wouldn't have thought that I could go ahead and let them do that without any permitting process. So it sounds like in part of having this in here is for the administration of it, so that you have a clear guideline. 
to interpret it for the public. Yeah, otherwise I, I would have probably had them go through a variance to get more. Unless we put, unless you put something in there that says we don't have to do that. I mean, well, I mean, I think it should be that way. I, and, but this is the way it is right now. Yeah. yeah I mean, so if I, mean, I go to other jurisdictions, that's, I can tell you that I don't ever run across, if I'm doing a, a oh gosh, a multi-unit development, I don't have to go and get signage approval where that is. All I have to get signage approval on is what is visible along the public right way in the front yard. So that includes... Well, that's that so building. interesting because this whole sign code has everything from little tiny uh, signs directional internally in a multi-tenant building like an office. It has, it, it regulates everything. I know. I mean, it just. Well, I mean, and then I would go to. I've had an issue with the, the signage section of our code since I was on the TRC and we were rewriting it. We kept kicking the, the can down the road. <coughs> letting, let's get this back. You know, let's just get through the rest of this, come back to the signage ordinance because Yellow Spring signage is different than it is in other communities. Well, we just rewrote it, like, what, yeah. last year? Well, we cleaned it up. Yeah, we cleaned it up. You know, we I mean, did a lot of work on it. Well, then, you know, I mean, it's, on, it's literally up to you guys. I'm just, because I wasn't involved in that, I wasn't paying attention. You know, I apologize. But, you know, that's just the way I interpret it. So would it would be acceptable to make the change in the current code that's necessary in order to make your job easier? Well, if we again agreed to return to the larger issue. Yeah, we could return to the larger oh, yeah. issue at yeah. some other future point, yeah. And that at least keeps them from, I'm trying to save them from yeah. having to go through a variance and yet at the same time, you know, we'll have permits for each individual sign. I mean, it was such a, it was a very strange ordinance that we went over and um, we didn't, I mean, I think we changed some things, but we didn't like wipe it clean. Um, and. I not having this addition definitely makes it based on the rest of the ordinance makes it so that they would have to follow this like that they couldn't have more signs without coming to getting a variance like that's that's just how it's written I I, I disagree that how it's written right now just makes if we didn't have this they would be allowed to do whatever they wanted back there. Well, can you, sorry, I'm just beating this one to death, but if you add <clears throat> that you give the zoning administrator the, the power to exempt that maximum requirement if he or she determines the location of the signs is not in the public yard or on the public right of way, does that give that Denise enough latitude to say, I can't even see the dang thing, go ahead and do what you need to do, yeah. or not? And maybe the only additional thing to add to that to, to maybe address your concern is or objectionable to neighbors. Yeah, I don't know. Um, you know that if, in your opinion, if you're what they're proposing, you say, but it's I think not you, yeah, and I think even with right the right site way. visit, I think that you know, um, if, if it's really close to a neighbor, then it might be saying, Yeah, you can do this, but you're not going to be able to illuminate it, right. or, you know. Yeah. Maybe something yeah. like along so that. you want to be able to do the site visit? Yeah, I think that, yeah. I mean, I mean, I thought that was the only way I'd be able to determine. Sure. It, then it sounds like the way it's written sounds okay for us. I mean, for now, and then some we can maybe visit later. I mean, as then I would like to move approval of the added language to the permitted signs. I'll second. So, who's the second sir? Did we have a public hearing? Oh. Yes. Yeah, we did. No, we did. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> that would have been a while. Yes. <laughs> I know. Styles. Yes. Go down. Yes. Close up. Yes. Okay. 128403 definition CD. Okay. Um, <coughs> we removed the, the square footage for uh, how, how much acre, how, like, 4,500 square feet, if you recall, for every dwelling on a lot, 
we removed that. We removed minimum requirements. Uh, we pretty much have, have let the code um, be, let the density uh, allowing that it's six per acre, eight per acre, 14 per acre, depending on what um, residential district you're in, be dictated by the setbacks and by the lot coverage requirements for each of those districts. So those existing uh, zoning requirements will pretty much drive how much density you can have. Okay, that being said, we had discussed this prior that anything it, anything over like say if it's one if it's 1.2 acres that as long as they meet the setback requirements you can just bump bump that whole unit up to the next full acre because that density what's going to drive it is everything else what how much parking you can get on it how, how, how big it can be that meets the building code and our own requirements for lot, gen, uh, lot coverage and setback. So rather than having this density gross density net, which I found somewhat confusing um, and didn't really quite understand the difference between the two, um, that much difference, rather than having that, maybe we should just have a definition of density. And density explaining how we compute it. So, computed by multiplying the number of units allowed per acre in a district. Any fraction of an acre may be rounded up to the next acre, for allowing additional density if meeting the minimum requirements of the district. And this came in, as you recall, when we were looking at 540 Dayton Street. If you would have taken it by, if you would have divided out by the acreage per this other thing, it would have been like three, it would have been the maximum, or 2.5 that they could have put on that property. But in fact, they could put four, they had to go through BZA hearing and they were able to put four because they could still meet every, all the setback requirements and the lot coverage requirements. So this just kind of would clarify that. I don't know what you think. It makes that. sense. It, made, it sounds simpler. Yeah. Does anybody else have any opposing thoughts to that that might, might that I'm not thinking of in this? I think you're on it. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to open a public hearing on the definition of density. Hearing the no public comments, um, closing the public hearing, and any discussion, motion? I move that we adopt the suggested language for 12.84.03. I second. Okay. Doden. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Sano. Yes. Stiles. Yes. Hoso. Yes. <coughs> And lastly, 128408 definitions RS. Um, we have under structure that basically anything that's uh, constructed, erected, erected, placed on the ground, which requires location on the ground, or is attached to something having location on the ground, is called a structure. And so we have solar panels that are sometimes um, added to um, that. Well, they're either added to the roof or sometimes they're added to an accessory structure, sometimes they're actually placed on the ground. And uh, what we, we require a solar interconnection agreement, uh, but we don't have a, we, we have, I have been permitting them through an accessory structure permit, which is a minimal fee, $15, uh, and, and considering it such so when they, go to the next place that, you know, if they have to go to Green County, which I'm pretty sure they do for the electrical part, they do have some type of zoning permit as well. So I just thought, just to explain that, just more detail so people understand um, that solar panels is considered a structure. So okay. what you're doing here is adding it because you've been treating it like this, is that correct? I've been treating it okay. like this, and, and you know, people have questions, you know, well, 
Is that yeah, really a structure? <clears throat> but it is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it is. And the building code requires that solar panels attached to the ground or a building get approval for structural and wind, mostly wind connections. So it's, you know, like Denise said, they got to get a zoning permit. Yeah. So they can do all the other things. And yeah. if, they, if they took it straight to Green County, they would, Green County would question them now. Yeah. They would just say, where's your zoning permit? So this is just for clarification for them. Okay. Um, open the pub I'm going to open the public hearing. Hearing no public comment. Close the public hearing. Um, do we have a motion? I move that we accept. Uh, adding solar panels as written to 1284.03. I second 08. 08. Okay, Janelle. Yes. Good. Yes. Stan? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Tulsa? Yes. That has <coughs> quite a lot. Okay, um, now um, we're going to have our discussion about how we're going to approach the comprehensive land use plan. And that's you. That's well, I would like to, before we get too far into it, I would just absolutely commend Dean Denise for finding this uh, Tip City one because I can't believe how it just is. It's, you know, um, it's amazing. <coughs> She, uh, she actually, Michaela actually called on some driveway. Uh, she called Green County and they mentioned Tip City for driveways. And so after that, I started looking and I found this Tip City comprehensive plan. I don't think I've shared it with you yet, but it's, it, I thought it was pretty. Oh, it's laid out. It has almost the same content as ours. It's formed a little different and then it goes deeper. Um, into planned areas, which I think we really need to do. But, you know, my feeling is that I just get focused on the planning commission and haven't had a chance to look at it to take time and then revisit this next time because we have so much on the table. Yeah, I just literally just found this. Okay. I sent the electronic version. If you already got your packets at one I didn't see it. So, um, so I can, I can make sure that everybody gets a hard copy of that. It's really an excellent. And it, what I thought was, and what I've been able to see of it too, it also included like their visioning. Yes. I mean, it's structured so much like ours. It's really amazing. You know, and I just think that from a, you know, since we have so much work to do, it, this is a much better guideline than if we were to try to go through and create a guideline. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we could almost follow this step by step and just use that overall format and then go at it section by section if everybody agrees that this is a good format to follow. I mean, uh, question, I mean, the, you know, having read through all of the hours over, over my spring break, uh, any time of producing a document like that, the first question that they consider is who reads it? Who, who is the document for? And so who who is the comprehensive land use plan? Who, who uses is that for document? Anybody who yeah. is looking to well, who really uses it? anybody in my profession that okay. if I go to the if I go to any community for the first time, okay, I always go there first. Okay. Because it's the policy document that defines where that community well, wants right. to be, where it so, wants to go, and then when I look at their zoning code, mm -hmm. I have a zoning code. code. Yes. Come. Yes. Okay. I, uh, who else uses it? I use it. Okay. Um, in determining um, uh, ideas that people are bringing forward, uh, well, I want to see if that actually fits into our vision and our comprehensive plan. So I will, I will look at it too. Yeah, you pull things from the comprehensive plan in our when you make a report to us yeah. about any um, anything that we're you know that you're making a report to us about and we're considering she pulls language from the comp plan and from yeah. the vision um, and, and a lot of this has if somebody comes into a community and they want to do things that they could literally go into a zoning code 
specifically and it's a little gray area so they try to push it through there's got to be a document that shows why that community well, wants to do what it does otherwise and that gives the administrator something legal to stand by mm -hmm. so that it doesn't become arbitrary yeah, no, I was just thinking in terms of like overall organization yeah. and the usefulness. Nonprofits use that. it because for applying for grants many times. Oh yeah. Because this documents what the what, what the community what, what, wants. What parts what do you go to first? You know, or or you know, what when people are, are, are looking at a, a comprehensive land use plan? I read it all. If I'm if I have a client going into a I read the whole thing. It doesn't take that long. They're, they're usually pretty short. Yeah, but is any one section? You have all, because all I was thinking is that in terms of prioritizing the organization. No, I see. It struck me as, I mean, when I was reading through ours, that the real core of it was the principles. Mm -hmm. And they're back on page 18. And they're not really even, not really much attention is called to them, even though that would seem to be the real part of the beast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, thinking about what parts of it get used the most and consequently making it most the most useful document for the people that use it in terms of deciding how it should be organized. Yeah, I think the history is, part is, of it is really important. I would agree with that because that was one of that really struck me mm -hmm. because I know I have read this before you know, and you just sort of like read them fast. When I was reading this again I was just so impressed by the historical aspect. In particular, I was looking at the Antioch College about how it had, you know, almost died and then came up again. I went, oh my goodness, we're seeing again how important Antioch is to this community. So I thought this historical perspective was That's really interesting. important. Interesting, but important. Because I think if you want to understand the community, you got to understand history. you got to know where we've been why and where we've been going and why and so you know i wouldn't want to tuck that way in the back i want that like from it <laughs> well i i personally would like um maybe some fact checking on some of that i don't know who <laughs> wrote it but um uh if uh scott sanders could take a look at that just from my own personal history it seems like there were some factual errors in there. could be I don't, I don't have my copy. Right, all I was thinking about when I was reading through it was the place mm -hmm. to start is who are the users of the document, and yeah, that yeah. needs to be the driving consideration for the big questions of overall organization and yeah. overall content. Mm -hmm. I think Make it as useful a document for people to use it as possible. I think that this, uh, the Tip City one, really does a better job than ours about laying out yeah, a better order. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it's impressive. I mean, it really is impressive. I, I was shocked. Because it was like reading, you know, with it, a different place, but it really laid out like what we're getting ready to do. I was just shocked how much it fit, what we're trying to do. And it was interesting how they, they even though we had, a, we had a visioning process, that was in 2000, uh, 12, I have it. 12, 2013. I mean, but they still got a lot of community input again for the for this for this document. Well, the uh, other um, questions I had was how, how the visioning document relates to the comprehensive land use plan, and then. As Marion brought up earlier, how is the housing needs assessment typically once that is done and it goes through council? How does that relate to? I mean, just right. even even legally, what's the relationships between between those documents? Because yeah, because it is basically a vision for what land we have yeah. and yeah. it's really important what we have. Yeah, they so. might need to be some merging mm -hmm. information between right. Yeah. But understanding what the relationship is between. Yeah, the, the comprehensive plan is a document that lays out, to me, lays out history, lays out land type, you know, every, what form yellow brings, and, what, and our watershed, and our, our ground type is different than any other place, you know. So it, it kind of gives you that sense. 
and then it goes into um, who we are as a community on a, on a political level, really, uh, in some manner, and that's usually of how we evolved into that. And from that, you now have an idea of why the, the form is what it is. And then you lay in more facts. You put in um, the census, you put in utilities, you put in um, where the bounds are uh, and why. And then that really then gives you this whole picture of what it is. And then you just re almost repeat that and you go through specific areas that are underdeveloped based on our vision. You know, and we have those. Yeah. Um, and that rolls it up out to the end, and then that's it. You know, well, you, you know, all I was talk, talking about right now is the vision and document and the housing needs assessment. The vision and document is laid in, it's actually laid pretty well in ours already to some degree because the principles came out of the visioning process. So I think that's got to be repeated. The housing needs assessment, and again, it's a bunch of factors like the the census, you know, and you talk about, um, oh gosh, population, age, and all of those things fit in that document actually backs up a lot of the census data that goes in the charts, you know, and that's, it gets laid out very specifically. So it's got to be integrated heavily in this particular comprehensive plan. In my view. Does anyone have a sense of how long it will take to revive, to, re to revise the comprehensive plan? I mean, clearly it depends on how much we change and change it. But I, and I'm asking the question because moving the housing initiative forward, having the comp plan be completed would be great. Um, but if it my, my goal is to have the housing plan at least generally completed by the end of this year. In other words, what we want to do in terms of housing. Not necessarily how we're going to do it, but what we want to do. But it's going to take longer than that, probably, for planning. Yeah, I mean, the vision took over a year, didn't it? Is it the vision process? Oh, yeah. This, look, I think a comp plan should take a year. Yeah. But um, are, we, are we going to be rewriting all of it, or are we more just re, sort of revising it, putting it in a different order? I think we're updating charts, certainly. We're, yeah. up, and we're updating, yeah, we're updating okay. appendices and trying to import those in to the body. And, you know, I mean, like, it's like Rose said, if there's somebody that hasn't fact checked, the history, you know, mm -hmm. but otherwise I see us taking the content of the existing plan and just really reorganizing it and updating it and putting it in a new form. Mm -hmm. Not doing a whole lot. I mean, I can't okay. see us rewriting the history. Great. Well, yeah, I think a lot of but, but I think that there probably should be some dialogue about the undeveloped areas. I mean, I know that, I mean, Mary, you said that you want to play commission's thoughts on Last farm, and I know that Matt has been talking about that for years. That we needed to kind of look at the whole northwest area of town, but we, we also need to look at the south end of town. What, what are we? Oh, I think so. We, every every gateway needs to be looked at, you know, pretty significantly. I think certainly the undeveloped parts of the community that are available or potentially available should be looked at. I mean, that's you know, and it, what, you know, Marion, you had mentioned something earlier about what you think planning commission's role is and, and what council is wanting to do. I typically, anything that, that would go in terms of planning, other councils that I've always been a deal with, they immediately pass it to planning commission to do that work. And they do that because planning commission is not a political body. It doesn't have a political agenda on what we're doing in terms of planning. You know, council's job is to say, we have a shortage of affordable housing. We have, you know, we, we put out to get a housing assessment. We want you to take this and lay it into the existing documents and see where that is. You know, but you don't, typically councils don't do that work. 
and so it, it confuses me. But well, that, but well, then, no, oh, I'm, can, I'm at the question point because I'm not clear. Um, I mean, we're sort of moving off this topic, but I'm not clear what exactly the role of planning commission is and isn't legally. Uh, and so I'm, I'm in, in a question mode. I'm not saying planning commission should or shouldn't or council should or shouldn't. I'm wanting to clarify. Well, because I feel like you're just learning right on the cusp of having it a little bit clearer. Mary asked the question about, well, sh I'd like to have this done before, well, I'd like to, you know, have the direction before we can. No, I, well, I mean, I'm saying, you know, when we get to the point where we start having, wanting to encourage development, then it would be nice to have a comment. Yeah, but we might get to that point of wanting to, we will probably get to the point of wanting to encourage development before the comp plan is I mean, I don't want to wait a year. Well, I, I mean, I understood you just want to have this thing completed by the end of 2018. I mean, I, you know, sort of my understanding from you folks, and you can, you've got the housing needs assessment completed, and the and council's job is political piece. How much of what do you want where? But planning commission's, uh, I think, ready to start the race, which is we've got the data, we've got the areas. Our job is to interpret all these pieces and say where something should or shouldn't go, but not what kind of something. That's not your job. So, I mean, I don't think your one needs to complete before the other because I think Planning Commission already has the data required to move forward. Does that so, make sense? So, do we want to, like, pick the, the addenda? What are the... There, there is one more that I think um, that I'm... Going to suggest perhaps it should be in because I hear having been to one of the um, housing needs meetings that there and, and reading uh, the document uh, the study that was done by is that a lot of discussion of the glass farm. We got a document um, in 2017 that talks about what you can do in, on development on the glass farm because a lot of the things proposed by this company aren't going to work because of the, um, um, the geography of the site. And so I think that needs to be a part because you can't be proposing to put like multifamily housing someplace or a lot of housing where it can't take So, that. I mean, if council says, hey, we want you to look at this particular area, that can be done outside of getting so, this plan done. I mean, so that doesn't need to be a part of well, this. I mean, it should definitely end up being in the comprehensive plan because it's a, it's, a, it's a piece of land, but I don't know that, that we can have the comprehensive plan done before. No, yeah. I was just saying that I thought that that yeah. document, part of it or whatever, it should be referred to because oh, yeah. it, it, it was very well done and it's really telling you what you can and can't do on that site. Are you having which? Well, there have been a couple studies. Of the it was the most recent one. Yeah, it was yeah, like right. just in 2017 that we yeah, got the document. Well, yeah. document. Yeah, yeah I'm I'm so that's the most recent I can think of. Um, I think you. I think you. I, I mean that. I'm not sure where we're going in this conversation. So right. yeah. Well, yeah, no, I, I was looking at the minutes, and yeah. we had discussed the possibility of just having a special section where we get together, and, and maybe that's what we need to do because you know that there can be more more I'm structured. Over I'd like to do that because I, I think, that would be think more, I can bring more, more right. um, information slash questions to the table yeah. for us, and probably maybe meet with the meet meet with Denise at a time, maybe with Judy, I'm not sure, maybe with Chris, to sort of frame issues. Well, I mean, I, I can share the, when, uh, I think Judy was the only one here, but when, when we did the charter review, uh, 
you simply, we had our meetings, we have a, we had an overview, what you're kind of doing now, which is okay, but in a broad sense, what are we looking to do? Why are we doing what we're doing? I think you've identified many of those issues already. And then, in terms of the structure moving forward, um, and if you, if you intend to use the Tip City document as a template, um, and one goes to the table of contents, simply look at that as a guide and say, all right, what's a, what's a realistic piece to bite off in a meeting? So, again, with the charter, we had discrete sections, charter sections one through nine, and we, that was our meeting goal. Um, so you just did it yeah, over a series of meetings just to get more. I, I think there are two conversations going on here, so I just want to make sure which I was talking just now about bringing the Planning Commission issues that I see regarding the housing initiative. That's different than the comprehensive plan. I might get more into it, but it's different. That's what I was talking about. Okay. You're talking about the comp plan. Is that right, Chris? Well, a little bit, because I, I mean, I think this, this well, is Judy's no, point that, 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 that there's there's a parallel path. Yes. But there's also a level of intersection. Yes. I think that the, the committee, uh, and you know, Marianne is the council representative here. There's where that intersection occurs. I think that you'll figure it out in the process. Um, but starting out, which is where I think that the. the Planning Commission is right now. How do we start the process? Uh, is putting a framework to that, and then in the context of when we look at this community profile um, housing, there's a discrete housing section. It seems to me that there's logical places where this is going to come up, particularly in the context of the evolving discussion that's going on in the community. I agree. I think that they are parallel, and I think that they. At some point, there are certain parts of it that will end, you know, and at that, that's when we hit on those points. You know, I mean, I I agree with Chris too about, you know, if to me, if we can look at the Tip City document and um, because I I really spent a lot of time looking at this, and I know nobody else has had a chance to do that, but I think that you know because we have other things on our plate tonight, I would recommend that we all take time to look at this and see if this doesn't really save us a lot of time when it comes to the structure of where we want to go and then maybe come back with a path on how to so attack the so so document before our next meeting. Yes. So do we want to have a separate meeting or do we want to, can we have separate meetings to sure. just discuss about it? It seems it's like that's what? To, to talk about the comprehensive plan. Work session. To have an actual work session and coffee. to with coffee. Do do we have to have it on Monday evening? No. I was gonna say because I'm gonna be having commitments. All how many Monday. how many people are even available? Uh, if if either weekends or during the week during the day. And we can also go into you know if you want to do just a few people that concentrate on it. Sure. You know, rather than mm -hmm. everyone. I mean, weekends are good with me. Once, okay. once the school year is over, then anytime. Okay. You know, as, as a teacher. Yeah. Weekends or evenings. But well, here, here's the other uh, possibility is you get a subcommittee. Charge your subcommittee with bringing that clear proposal to each meeting. Here's what we've gotten. We hashed it around for four hours, drank a lot of coffee, and here's what our best the thing is, and if the rest of the, I mean, you have to sort of have the agreement of the rest of the body that they're not going to second guess you too far on it if, if they're char if you're charged with that and you're entrusted with that. But uh, I think no, it's a very efficient way to go. To you don't have to take minutes. You don't have to be recorded. You because you're going to come with work product, which will then be published. The subcommittee would have to have two people. Is that right? You can't have a quorum. And right. it could also in include Denise, it can also yeah. include myself. It so only two people, people, not three. Only two people from the right. the well, body. Um, from the planning commission mm -hmm. plus staff. And then and then you could re you could access other community resources that may or may not be villagers for their expertise to assist in the process. Maybe like bringing in like <clears throat> the persons you mentioned for history. 
you know, you could, they could be a standing member on the committee, you could invite guests in because of their, their unique knowledge and tap into those resources. In fact, I mean, and, and when you look at what Tip City did, it, it certainly would indicate that that's exactly what they did. Um, they've got uh, on page, I don't know what page it is, five, three, pardon me. They've got their comprehensive plan steering committee um, that include, they have two consultants involved. Um, and that, you know, that suggests to me that they allocated some budget, some money for that, but that's a potential and area that's, that you know, village could explore as well. Yeah, village could explore that as well. You could pull a board of zoning appeals member over. Yeah, and but I'm saying you can also budget for a little bit of this as well. Can we get copies of that prior to our packets? She's making copies now. Oh, okay, great. So we'll be able to. Okay, because I'd like to look at before. Yeah. You know, I would kind of like. I I think I would not have a problem with two people and and staff and any consultants working on. But I kind of maybe like to have a first session that with as many of us as we could as a work session just so that we all sort of know if we're on the same page, if we're going helpful. the right way. And then after that, you know, if I'm not one of them, I would trust, I mean, I'm certainly probably going to start with questions, but I think I, you know, would be willing to have a couple people working on it. And I think that would be helpful for whoever is on that subcommittee too, yeah. to have for from everybody more And I really am ordained yeah. believer in work sessions, you know, get it off of the regular agenda and focus on nothing but that, you know, the idea of bringing the subcommittee work to the work session really makes sense. Well, doing it another way hasn't worked so far, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and the thing is, is, is conditional use hearings and site plan reviews can just blow that yeah, yeah, agenda, okay. you know, which it has right. to have a time when we can just focus on that and Frank's leading that train for us, so. You want to set something up for uh, evening during the week? Do we yep. have Do we have any days available during the week? Or mm -hmm. the evenings. Yeah, that would be a good day. You know, you just throw a hand up if you're available during the day, because that changes the picture for everybody. Okay, then it's nights, and then we get more limited because we've got yeah all kinds of Yeah. Well, I think the first thing to do is find out if there's a subcommittee if it's willing to take this on. Well, you were talking about us meeting first, first all of before us the summer. Yeah. 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 And then in that work session, maybe we can identify who okay. wants to be on the subcommittee. Because no, maybe all of us would say, oh, I want to be. You know, and then it's going to be a big work session. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, one of the things I would say is one of the things that they did with the, the charter review is that there was a decision made on the size of the committee. We know that there's likely going to be two planning commission members. We know that there will be staff involved. And then identifying what resources you might think that you want from the village in terms of somebody to be on the committee as a, and I'll say, a, a fixed member, a permanent member, uh, rather than a guest. And what do you want, five people, seven people? And then identify. Um, who from the village, certainly Denise. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and because you, you want to make sure that you have a workable size. I think on, on charter review, what do we have, about nine? Yeah, but I, I don't know if you want to go the whole, I don't think you want let's to go have a committee that. thing. I mean, right. if you stay with subcommittee with invited guests, you stop, you avoid the political context, you avoid who appoints what members of what and how. Yeah. yeah. It's worth it. And then we'll be discussing everything back it when it comes, comes back, back to, to us anyway. Component yeah. anyway, yes. And, and, you know, frankly, in that context, because you'll be having your regular meetings, you can have a placeholder on your agenda to discuss a discrete item that's a part of the report. Mm -hmm. So there's progress that's, that is demonstrated and discussed. Okay. And you can also, just I mean, with regard to the housing piece being a variable, if, for example, Marion is not on the subcommittee. Another council person who is involved in that housing process and is knowledgeable can come and do that same thing. I mean, there are kind of ways to still gather that information without blowing the. Com 
you know, the way your the things course. comprise. Yeah. Okay. Um, so can we talk about having our first meeting before we break up into a subcommittee? That's a good idea. Um, an evening. Let's. Do you want to do this? Does anybody want to like email me and just let me know what evenings and okay. we, the weekends you have available? You should not have your calendar here. Okay. Do you want to say a particular time period? Um, what's, yeah, that might be good too. If it's like any during a particular week or two weeks. Well, if there is, yeah, a particular day, can we come to that? So we on, on work sessions, I don't have to advertise those? No. Oh, if it's yeah. a so, body yeah, yeah, you do. work session, yes, you do. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. If it's a work session, you would still need that. So we need to be at least three weeks out. Well, no, two. No. Two I mean, I, in fact, it's Monday. I mean, it could be next week, but not that I'm so we could do it next week. week. We could do it the following week. The following week, yeah. So you're saying you don't have to, you, know, you don't have to do ten days ahead of the next. Yeah, next. So work session. So Rose, you work. And Frank, you work during the day, both of you. So would a Saturday potentially work, like the 28th? Well, no, Saturdays. Saturdays will work hard. Are you? Yeah. I mean, is Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday? Or Monday, Tuesday? The 28th, I'm going to be starting the 23rd. Okay. And I'm going to have a class on Monday night. Oh, OK. The 25th, is that a possibility? It's a Wednesday. Yes. And I have a class on Wednesday night. Twenty six. Yeah, Thursday the twenty six. I do have some. Okay. How about the Tuesday? How about the twenty fourth? Okay. Okay. Did everyone say okay? And there's not. Um, do we want to do it at six? Oh, I would like to do it earlier. Yes, six. Yes. Five. Five people. No, no, can't be here, okay, six. Six? So what are we thinking? Six to nine? Yeah. Have pizza? Mm. Four, oh, I think a three-hour meeting would be ambitious. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I would encourage you to think about six, that. Six a two-hour meeting. Six to eight? Okay. Yeah. That sounds even better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A three-hour meeting would be very enthusiastic. <laughs> six, we said. Six. On the twenty-fourth. Cool. And Frank, you have an idea of how you want to set that up? Um, uh, I don't know if it's top of my head. Okay, but just let me know if there's anything you need from me as far as creating an agenda for it or okay. materials. I mean, I just the things that we've already discussed okay. and uh, be looking at. Uh, the Tip City. Yeah, everybody has worked at the Tip City document, mm -hmm. the current document, and to think about those big issues about overall content and organization. Okay. And then beyond that, how to proceed. Okay. Well, I think having a Tip City document. Well, and might it be worth doing that or over to Tip City, or I could do the same thing, speak with their village manager or their town manager and say, how'd you do this? How'd you, how did you put this together? What was your format? Well, how did you, I mean, just gather some information from a couple of communities, because they obviously did an outstanding job of putting the document together. And they hired a consultant. In front of yeah, And that's why yes, you but so, we, <laughs> so we oh. reap the benefit of exactly. how did that consultant yes. organize you so yeah. that it turned out this way. Okay. Um, I did come up to, okay. Um, so I just, with doing like preliminary research for this, um, I did talk to Andrew Rodney of uh, Centerville, and he gave some advice as far as um, hiring like a consultant, like and like having like partial work done, whether it be like organization or content wise. So I can definitely reach out to him again for more specifics. And then I can call Tip City, or I think Sugar Creek was also one. Um, but yeah, I can absolutely do that. But as far as that goes, one of the fine. biggest things we're going to have a hard time doing is, you know, I don't think Denise has the ability to software, but you know, to be able to take text and 
put it into a document. You know, it's, it's like a mini PowerPoint, but PowerPoint obviously wouldn't work. But some, you know, software program that allows you to do this and import photos and maps. Oh, and, so you don't have to then re enter it. Yeah. I mean, at least it, you know, it's formatted in a certain way that helps you to do that. That's what a consultant brings to the table first. And then they have, you know, they have the ability to reach out to their own library and import text and data and, you know, do things. That's what, again, what a consultant does that we would have a hard time doing. But I don't think that the content behind our existing comprehensive plan is that far off to dictate getting a consultant in to do that portion. But the formatting of the... Yeah. Is the existing plan in, in a uh, editable format, Word format already? Oh, I'm sure that it is. Yeah. It's a Word document. Yeah. Just assume that it is. But. Yeah, it is. Is there anybody in the community that has that software you're talking about that might be willing to? The grant work? writers are ones that have, okay. you know, a lot of that Word Smith and stuff. I mean, I, I don't know. It's never been a part of what I do. Well, and, and that may be something Michaela can track down as well if we if she gets the information as to the consultant. And there is some funding available for boards and commissions to be able to bring some money for it. Oh, okay. Yeah, without having to do a big, mm -hmm. yeah, expensive thing. Just any graphic somebody to organize to get that yeah, really Well, and then the next thing maybe even is to see how much money we might have available you know, as a budget. Okay. Yeah. Um, are we set on Tuesday and we can move on to our last two things? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, we have some new business um, that Denise has been working on. Yeah. Um, one being the RV parking tiny homes, mobile homes. Uh, talk to us about that. Okay, so we have in the zoning code a few things, um, and, and it's come up lately uh, through uh, complaints that have been filed um, in the zoning office with people that are parking recreational vehicles around town and parking <laughs> them, and uh, the only place to th that it's even mentioned our recreational vehicles is in the zoning code. And it's kind of, uh, I, I get that it's in there because if it's used as a dwelling, but it's not in our uh, general offenses code, so there's not really any ticketing of people who are parking on the streets and that kind of thing. So I wanted to just review that part of it, but as well as the whole idea of RVs and then as this tiny home thing has exploded, I get people all the time that are calling me and wanting to know if they can have park a tiny home on a lot. Right now, the way the code is, you could basically what I've told people is if you put it on a permanent foundation and it's connected to our utilities, you can have a tiny home. It has to be permanently on the ground. Now, that doesn't mean it can still be like on the trailer part of it. That's where that's where it's starting to get a little more confusing. But I basically tell them no, they have to actually put it onto the ground. Um, so there's some concerns about that and the way the zoning code is and what, what do we want to consider in the future. So um, Right now, we have in the code uh, dwelling, manufactured home. Uh, a manufactured home being something that's fact built, single family structure, transportable, and a couple pieces on a permanent chassis. And I, I use the Unibel as an example for that. But is that also a tiny home? That goes to how they are regulated relative to each state inspection. If you're a mobile home, you have to have, like you know, have to have an on-site 
state inspection for all of its structure, its wiring, plumbing, HVAC, its energy compliance, and how the fasteners all work together that it applies to all those code restrictions. And so that certification leads the factory. So then when it comes to a specific site and that mobile home unit goes on a permanent foundation, the county looks for that sticker and cannot look in that mobile home unit for compliance. It can only look at where it's connected for public utilities and foundations. So, so that's, what, <coughs> that's what classifies it as a mobile home. If it's on wheels and it just sits on a site, it's an RV, it's a recreational vehicle, period. Because there's no difference than a 30-foot recreational vehicle with a full shower and kitchen in a tiny home. It's on wheels. So I've always thought that mobile homes are not permitted in this village. They're not. Because a mobile home, there's, well, actually there's a, a mobile home is only called a mobile home until it's put on a foundation. If it's on a permanent foundation, it's no longer a mobile home, it's a permanent home. It's just how it's regulated through the state for inspection. There's specific things in the Ohio Building Code about what's called a mobile home. So when you when you see like a mobile home park, like what you see in Fairborn, um, then those are on permanent foundations. So you're saying that those would be allowed? We have them in town. We have mobile homes in town. And so, so does it become then a manufactured home? Yeah, it's a manufactured home. Because it, it's, I mean, what I what I think about traditionally as a mobile home, I, I've not seen that in town, but I I know we have unibelts in town, which are like. Oh, well, that's it. They're on permanent foundations. But yeah. there are like the Virginia yeah. has mobile homes that aren't on. Well, now that's a different, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, they're, that's a zoning thing. They become, it's like an RV park. It becomes a, a mobile home park. You're allowed to have mobile home parks. And what that means is that you are on a temporary facility. So otherwise you connect temporarily to something that moves. And there's a whole lot of restrictions that you don't have to comply to there when it comes to things like wind loads and all this other stuff that's why they're not legal in towns because they're dangerous. They blow away. <laughs> I mean, they're just dangerous. Yeah. They're affordable. Right. Well, well yeah. but I mean, if you, but, but they'd be affordable even if you put them on a permanent foundation. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And they're safe now. Yeah. They're safe. Yeah. And they protect the public. Yeah. Right. That's true. You have to be able to protect those around you as well. Yes. So So the way the zoning codes are deal with it is that they classify them as recreational vehicles until they get put on a site and put on a firm, permanent foundation and then they become a permanent structure. Or they stay on wheels and they get zoning introduced as more like a mobile home park where you can connect to, temporarily connect to, and do things like that. I think that we want to, you know, that's a big leap for us to allow RV mobile home type parks, not permanent, structure park within the village limits. And the, you know, the vast majority of cities and towns don't allow the vast majority for the reasons of is, safety and public health. Is having like one allowed per lot, you know, still that same kind of public nuisance problem? Like what are we or what are we trying like to avoid? If it's on, I think what I'm hearing is you could put a mobile home, even one that looks like what you traditionally see as a mobile home, or if, it's, if it's on 
a permanent foundation, and it's attached to that with sewer connections. But then you have to follow that only one principal dwelling per lot, and then and then it, then they would have they wanted a secondary. It would be the accessory dwelling. A dwelling unit have to have a permanent foundation be connected to cities to services electric. Like but are we? But we also don't allow any anything on wheels to be lived in in the village, right? So are you asking? Well, it looks like we do allow in the parking and in the recreational vehicle parking. It says it says temporary occupancy for periods up to seventy two hours. Okay, so we allow it for seventy two hours, but nothing will let the visitors. Yeah. Unless it gets put on a permanent phone. Great. Yes. And it's connected to service. So, and I, I would just like to say, I'm not going to put up a huge fight right now, but I think the whole thing about uh, mobile home parks is a classes issue more than a safety issue. And uh, I frankly would love to have a mobile home park in Mellis Park. And I think that people should be able to live in tiny houses or um, RVs on a lot with a, a, a sort of an accessory dwelling for more than 72 hours. Maybe not permanently, but like a month, but two months, months. But it months. does get into a safety thing if you can't have it permanently attached to the ground. I don't think I don't think we're disputing the idea of, of a mobile home. No, um, but it. I mean that you, that okay, just increases. I'm you, just saying I think it's a classist thing, and I think it's the classism that's driving it, not the safety issue. And so, totally can just a public question. safety and health issues. So you're saying that it would have the wheels still on it, where yeah. what Chad is saying and, and Denise is the wheels are removed. Yeah, and that just yeah. adds to the expense. I mean, I know, like my friend who came moved here from Athens, Ohio, her granddaughter was living in a mobile home. It did not have a foundation, and they could afford to do it because it's so much cheaper, and you can buy one for like you used to be able to buy one for. I have the same concern about safety because like just this last Tuesday, the anniversary of the big tornado in Xenia, I'm in the township and I'm one that I didn't have a direct head, but I had the high winds head. And so we had a lot of destruction there. I used to live in Oklahoma and where I lived, Norman, Oklahoma, there was a uh, community that had a lot of mobile homes that were hit every time by tornadoes. Extraordinarily dangerous. And so I think that's really frightening because this area we're experiencing more high winds and things. And but so it's not like they're not issue. allowed to be on the property in you know, the Springs. It's that they're not allowed to be lived in. lived in. And the living in is what is the problem. Because it's when you're I mean, if you're living in it and the high winds and everything come. Well, that's the not a public safety issue, though. That's the, the person's the, private oh, safety it's issue. It's separate issues. So if you're talking about those vehicles actually being there as a public safety issue, you're talking about things being thrown onto other properties, correct? You're also talking about wastewater, connected domestic water, and electric. Yeah, everything has to be connected to yeah. our utilities. And, and if you and try to that. temporarily connect the waste water line yeah. to something that's on wheels, it's a problem. Yeah. It's hard because you don't you don't have that fixed connection. Therefore, if that thing moves six inches, it can disconnect that waste water line. But there are people, you know, like what if it was. Um, we can't. We don't have to be stuck to the way that it is written now, and you know, people living in those units could use the primary dwelling units facilities, right? Isn't part of planning they're talking about you know, looking at safety for everybody? Yeah. So it's not just that. Well, that's their choice. They're living in it. Uh, if they get hurt. But as we're planning, we're supposed to be looking at this community and saying these are potential issues and coming up with solutions for them or, re or recommendations for that. Yeah, but I think when you, when you 
when you use really simple language like overarching language like it's a public health issue or it's a public safety issue without going into exactly what damages you're talking about that's when you um, can be that's when it starts to sound like it's a class issue really when you don't address the things that are who who you're trying to protect from what you know when when some things are allowed and where that line is that this isn't allowed but this is allowed um, in the way that people want to live on their own property I mean I, I know I, I know there are people who live in tiny houses in this village on wheels yes there are sometimes illegal. someone will, illegally uh, um, there are people who maybe have a small house, they have a teenager, they might have an RV, and that teenager uses the RV as their bed. They live in it. And this thing about safety, I mean, yeah, it's, I, mean, I don't disagree if a tornado comes through and hits an RV or thing on not, it's not on foundation, it's more likely to turn over than something on foundation. But you know, I mean, I have a tree outside in front of my house, a tree could fall on. I mean, we can't, there's only so much we can do for safety, and I still say it's a classist issue, and it's based because we don't want that in Yellow Springs. I totally. I mean, I, I put mine back on the Ohio Building Code and why building codes were written, and my arguments go to that purpose and that purpose only. And when we talk about life, safety, and health, that building code is there for that purpose. Now, do I want to go into a big debate about why the Ohio Building Code exists? No, I don't have to. It's the laws of the land for for the purpose of public health, safety, and welfare. That's what it's there for. So, so if, I just rely on that guy. So if you wanted to allow tiny homes on wheels, what would you have to go about and do? That, or would you be violating the code? Well, yeah. you would have to say, at this point, it's classified as an RV. It's allowed to sit on that lot for 72 hours. It has to be moved. If we want to change it to permanent, we can say, and we have every right to say, we don't have any hourly restrictions on the storage of a recreational vehicle on any private property for any length of time. And we're done. Which we don't. We don't. We already don't for storage. It's when it's used as a dwelling is where the 72 hours comes into play. Yeah. Well, if it's if it's being used as a dwelling, then it's incumbent upon the person that property it is to make sure that their safety and the health of the individual inside safety is is procured. So, if it is 10 below zero and somebody fell asleep in an unheated facility on that property that homeowner is liable for the death of that person who wrote the death. We could do that in the house or so. Sure. So and like, all the people in Yellow Springs who have lost their utility. Well, and I'm, just, I'm curious about like sanitation and that yeah, kind of issue. I mean, I've had complaints from people who've been worried about people living next door that are living in an RV, and they wonder about the sanitation and those kinds of issues. That's why they have to move every 72 hours. Well, I've got a question for Planning Commission. <coughs> if the debate, I'm not judging it. I'm just is, telling you guys the facts. This is just what I'm But if the debate is something that can be affordable versus safety, I find it interesting that we are very willing to let people who are poor live in substandard conditions. Uh, there's a standard. That's a good point. And if you're, I mean, look at who's sitting at this table. Figure out how you make a, a compliant structure affordable rather than saying we should, poor people should be able to live wherever they want and so what if? They can't flush a toilet or if it will blow away in a tornado because they deserve that right. To me, that's a bizarre way of saying it's okay if you're not safe as I am yeah. because I want you to have a house. I mean, it's a, you can argue both ways, but I really see it as your job as a planning commission to, is to assure that, that safety. The other piece is the political piece. So you guys get to figure out, well, then how can we? make it safe and not substandard and affordable. 
Well, Anybody? that Denise well, has been, well, I mean, is, is, is not necessarily about if we're going to change it, but like, if, if we want this to be more, I mean, when, when you get complaints like this about other things that people are, I mean, the thing, the thing about this is that you're being at, when you're being asked to enforce this, you're being asked to run people out of their home, right? Like you're well, being asked to be told someone you you cannot park your RV here, you cannot live here, right? Well, in in, the, in, in this one particular case, the RV is parked in a public right of way. So, I mean, you're not allowed to live in your car on a public right of way. How is this your problem? Why are the police not dealing with it? It's just they are. They make a move every seventy-two hours. Do they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, yeah, pretty much that's what has happened. But they're not even. <laughs> if you look at the zoning code, it's supposed to be on private. It's not supposed to be on a public street. Okay. At any at, time. At that point, it's a car. Yeah. But see, here's the problem. It's only this this part in where it says it shall be unlawful to park right. on a street. Under 12603 parking and storage. That's only in the zoning code. That's nowhere else in our codified ordinance. Is there a state law that you're not allowed to sleep in your car on a ride way? I don't know. I would I'm imagine not, there I'm is, but I don't know. Officer, off the there is an ordinance. You, you are not. I mean, that it seems like that's more what we're looking at there. I just, I'm not sure why it's in the zoning code. You're not sure what, the, par the parking and storage recreation vehicle? Yeah. It, I mean, like, the first part, I don't know why it's in the zoning code. The second part, I guess, could be, I, I, it's just really kind of difficult to. Well, it says, you know, if, if it if it's think. being used by the owner or guests of the owner of the lot that the, you know, that it's there, I mean, it seems like the issue that you're having isn't that, right? In, no. in no way does this allow for what you're having complaints about. Right. Well, what I'm, I'm having complaints about is on a street. Yeah. Or in a public parking lot. Or and, but it's like not the person who lives right. It's not like they're parking But see, if you, when this happens then, you have, then the police has to follow. They, it's now up to me. I'm the zoning administrator. So what do I then do? I have to follow the zoning code for, for enforcing it, which is a letter. And they get, you know, told that they have to move. And often the police will deliver it, but then they move and then they come back. I mean, there's no, there's no uh, enforcement. There's not the kind of enforcement that that where you get a ticket. I I don't ticket people. And if it were in planning, would there be a ticket? No, no. I mean, no. some I mean, things would. in the police department's general offenses code, then maybe yes, right? There would be there be a ticket if you were. Oh, uh, there could be a ticket. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's where enforcement on public right of ways for recreational vehicles or anything is. Any vehicle, like Rose said, it could be a car or a van. It doesn't matter. It doesn't say that you're allowed to to park. It's it doesn't. There's no. It's not even. It shall prohibit the use for periods up to 72 hours shall it shall so basically the same so are you reading that as but if that's you, only if it's if you're if using it as a right that's only well, if, well, it, if it's on your property a residential district and is for the use of the home owner or the lot of the lot so that's in other the words, only time that that an RV can be parked on the street no, no, this says it's it unlawful. Says it shall not prohibit 
temporary occupancy for up to 72 hours, provided that it is parked oh, on a lot. So you can park it on the street. If you park it on the street, it is not allowed. I'm not, if, I'm not, I'm even not thinking I'm reading the way you're saying that. Even if it's 72 hours, it's not no, allowed. No, the first sentence does give you, as long as you're not using it as a dwelling. Is, is it, it, it says you can park it. Yeah, 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 but if they are using it as a dwelling. Well, then it has to be on private property. Yeah. And for periods of no more than 72 hours. But yeah. you can park it on the street and use it for a dwelling. Yeah, it's but it, you right. can park it on the street. park it on the street. Just like a car, you so you can't park right. on the street. You just can't do something. You can probably sleep in a car on your own property as long as it does it's under 72 hours as well. But no, it doesn't have a sleeping accommodation. It doesn't have sleeping accommodations, but you can't. Tornado might come. So you're saying you're you're saying that yes, they shouldn't be parking on the street. It's very confusing because if you read down to the next line, he's, he just pointed out, and the next line is um, in a residential district. There's another. Yeah. So I mean, this comes down to the I think like. You, but that that references, I, I would call that heavy equipment, trucks, loaders. And so then you have to get into the definitions. I think the, the recreational vehicle is a defined vehicle. And right. the intention is that 1260.03 would apply to the recreational vehicle, and therefore it would not be lawful to park on the street, alley, highway, or public but place. But once we know that it's unlawful, then what happens? That's the question. And we I, understand that it's not allowed, right? So does our, our police not have the ability to enforce zoning code? I'd have to track it back through the code to, to look at that. I haven't looked at the issue. Okay. But there's often a provision that says it, there's such a thing as an unclassified misdemeanor. Yeah. But I can't answer the question today without digging in. Okay. Well, maybe we just need to continue this discussion, but I get that. I mean, one of the things, recreational vehicles are defined in the zoning code when they do include, like, um, in definitions, it, it includes boats and campers and things like that. And you see that around town, boats that are parked on the street and they just, they just there seasonally for a long period of time. And I know that it's been a problem. Well, but, but if they're not using them as a dwelling. Right, right. I think they're allowed to. I mean, yeah. no, they're not, though. It says, <laughs> No, you can park it on the street. It you just be, can't park it on the street be and use it as a for any person to park or cause to be parked a mobile home or recreational vehicle on any street, alley, highway, or other public. Oh, and, and to use, and to use it as a dwelling. As so a you can park on the okay. street. You just can't park on the street and use it as a dwelling at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the only thing that there is in the code, um, in the general fences code, or there's 452.20, which talks about trucks. Construction equipment. Uh, exceeding ten thousand pounds, so can we can we add a recreational vehicle, parking truck or a recreational vehicle? I mean it is essentially a but truck. But one of the things is like even for people living in our I mean it's already prohibited what you're trying to what you're trying to I think what Denise is saying, though, is that to the extent that there's no sanction for doing it. Yeah. Okay? So we have to determine whether or not there's, there's a sanction that can track back to 1260.03. Uh, and Frank, I want to clarify something that you said. Uh, that when you look at 1260.03b, you have to go to the next sentence, so that says recreational vehicles may only be parked. So, and then it goes on private lots for off-street parking, backyards, and alleys. Oh, so. that's what I said, suggested. Oh, that's, so that's your, that's yeah, your yeah, that's underlined. Okay. It's underlined. Yeah. It's underlined. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Oh, my bad. Yeah. Okay, so well, but, but would that, I was part of so is it, is it a matter of, is it a planning commission thing, or is it a village council thing that needs to be? Well. It, it depends on where you put it. <laughs> it's in the zoning code, so that's okay. why I'm bringing it to you guys first. If it's a zoning code text amendment, it would need to be here. Okay. If we put it into the criminal code, it would go to council. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. There, there could, but it's possible already that there, there is something that exists that, that would let Denise 
have the police give them a, what is it, an undefined misdemeanor? An unclassified, unclassified misdemeanor. misdemeanor. But certainly nothing would pro prohibit the police from citing any individual and just give them a warning. Yeah, the, they, the, they give warnings. But there are, there are likely other statutes that uh, exist within our code and yeah. the Ohio Revised Code that could lead to a citation of something else yeah. based upon the conduct. Yeah. It's how many times can the police warn someone and they mark? Well, they, basically, what the what the what staff people have said is that they just don't feel that a public right away, a public street, which all of us taxes paid for and maintained, should be the place where somebody stores their yeah. piece of whatever. And there is so a trailer. There isn't a time limit on, on parking on the street. Not yeah. if you interpret it like this. Yeah. And, and, and it becomes a, pro a problem for them like with snow, snow removal, removal and trying to clean up and getting around this stuff. And so the, some, the concern is, is just the parking of them on the street, not necessarily the living in them on the street. Well, I have the thing with right. the living in it. But other people like, are concerned how, about How do you even determine that? I mean, if you just. Uh, well, I mean, you, you've changed, you've made suggested changes on. I, I made this exhibit A. Uh, to me, it seems like there could be instances like, say, say my relative has driven from California in their RV. They, there's not enough room to park in my parking lot, but they want to park on the street in front of my house. I mean, that seems to be allowable for a limited period of time, but the idea of having RVs and boats and those things parking on the street for as, as the, where they park, I can understand why people would be upset about that. And, yeah. So it seems like we need to have some kind of balance. So in that proposed language that you have, probably you need to, because there you are prohibiting anyone from parking on the street. That's true. And so maybe to say that it could be done maybe for up to like two weeks. Or I mean a, a short period of time. But if you may be having somebody visit for a couple uh, yeah. weeks, that, and then it has to be moved. So, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, by just by saying that where it can be parked, on private lots, then the assumption is it can't be on a public street. Is what you're yeah. by, by striking that. Well, you actually say in this part that it may not be parked on oh, the street. Right, right, right. Yeah, you did say that. Which is probably okay because I think that you don't want these enormous vehicles yeah. parked all year round with boats and various things. I don't know how many there are. Maybe there aren't even oh, enough yeah. to worry about. And then, but it the might be a size matters as well. Yeah. So I got a suggestion because of course we don't want to be classes in any way. If this goes back to the PD for literally what are the safety, what are the safety and plowing and sanitary, what are the concerns, what is it that you'd like to see that filters through Denise and comes back either to the criminal code or to this body, I feel like you guys don't have all the information that you need from staff, from the PD, what are your concerns? Right. Why is it important that we not allow? Why do you want this to be changed for this reason? That if you've got that, then you've got traction. Right now, you're trying to figure out why is it a bad idea? Yeah. Should there be a fine? And that's not your job. Well, it's, if, we could, if we take it out of our, and we put it in, we're not going to be the ones putting it into the general offenses code, right? That would have to be. No, the, I mean, I, th I think if the PD says we want that in the general offenses code, then you have some marching orders. If they say, well, these are our big concerns. We'd like planning commission to decide if, in fact, that's an issue in residential districts. We think it is. Maybe it's not. Then it comes back to the planning commission with their concerns, and then this body's got at least that those firm concerns to kind of wrangle. I with. mean, I think more. I think it's separate when I'm talking about a class issue, I'm talking about mobile homes and tiny homes, things that with wheels on them. 
being on the property. But I have friends who are truck drivers, and you no. can't bring your semi, and you can't park that semi in a residential district, and that's yeah. an issue. Yeah. So it's a class issue. I, yeah. I mean, it yeah. is. I would okay. joke a little bit. Not, yeah. not entirely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, but when we're. But the. Um, but being able to park large vehicles on you, you know, the street, which is a public area to park for just indefinitely, right? Like large vans or buses or boats, right? That aren't going to move all the time. That they're just using that parking spot as a as their own personal parking spot, right? I think that is that's a a public a a public issue more than someone living in it, right? Like that that someone's using that as as an extension of their property, really. Right. Right. It, it would seem to me that the follow up on what Judy said is that the input from planning commission has raised a number of points that require further investigation and that the planning commission simply ought to task staff to come back and prepare another report that addresses some of the issues that may or may not include some Great. recommendations to the code that will determine whether or not it's a planning commission issue or a council issue right. but we don't have enough information we know just table it for now and then move forward because that needs to do more work Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, Great. next. And I'd like to suggest that we table the next, I mean, it's past 9 o'clock. That's my most important one of all. Oh. I'm so sorry, but I really kind of want to plow through this. <coughs> okay. Is yeah. everybody willing? I'll try to plow through it a little bit. Um, and, I, and, and I've talked with Chris today, so maybe he can even clear a little bit better than I can, um, and it's it's this it's this minimum lot frontage statement. But Denise, what is it that you want from planning commission? Let's start with that. What, why is this on the agenda? Uh, just want to clarify the the um, how we go about with these uh, lot splits and road access easements that are coming to me. I've had probably a half a dozen of them. And, and here's what my suggestion would be, is that following our conversation today, we, Denise and Amy Blankenship and I spoke for about an hour and a half today about this issue. I think that we developed some clarity that didn't exist before this was put on the agenda. I think that given the time, given the desires of what I'm hearing, I think that, that we can come back and we can give you another report that summarizes what I think the staff's position would be based upon input from the solicitor's office and then we can address it to you in that context with what we interpret the code to say and then you can hear what that is because you'll be the body that sometimes will have to determine whether or not that's appropriate in the context of a staff report. And that would provide more clarity. There, yes. there is, you can look at it so many different ways and you can interpret it different ways. And, and, uh, I don't want to go down a road with people in the community and not have it right. So. Sure. Well, I think, that, I think in a broader sense that the, the real issue is it's that um, ultimately this could end up on planning commission's table and that it's an issue that planning commission needs to be aware of before that happens. And um, we've come up with, we think, a, an approach that makes sense, that's consistent with what the code says, but um, there is an interpretive piece to that as there seems to be in many zoning codes. And that's what we really want to discuss with you. Are, are you okay with that, Denise? Sort of, yeah, leaving it here. Uh, just, yeah, just uh, bring it to the next meeting. Yeah, but I want to act on it fairly soon because I have people that want to do things with their property. Well, Denise, would you be then coming and saying, "This is what I think makes sense in this kind of situation"? Well, with Chris's and yeah. as well. Yeah, you're going to come with some recommendations or mm -hmm. options. Yeah. I'll be right behind Denise. Thank you, thank you so yeah. much for all the work you've already done. Yeah. And yes. I think that will be helpful because yeah. I was real confused. I was feeling your it, it, it is yeah. confused. Yeah. Yeah. But let me say this, it, it, this to, to streamline this issue. If you take the first page of what Denise put and you look at the, what the language is, 
any lot created after the effective date of this code shall have frontage on an approved public street or approved private street or access easement equal to the minimum lot width required lot width. The question is where does that lot width start? Is it, do you have to have it on the street or is it on the lot that the easement or the access is going to if it's, if, if it's that's the piece? So Ted's shaking his head. He thinks it needs to start from the street. Um, and uh, there's a, But I showed you the example of Miami Township, but you had said you could kind of go out here and then go back up narrow and go back. Yeah, you saw it. I mean, he had one on King Solvers a lot. Mm -hmm. I showed him that. Price. That's the example in the packet. Yeah. Uh, street exhibit exhibit and exhibit then it, it narrows down to nothing, and then it goes to a lot. But that's how I've always exhibit. seen I mean, I've always seen on public exhibit B2. Exhibit B2. But I don't want to start. Right. You know, if you got, I mean, I'd be, I would love to talk to you about that. The township requires you to put frontage. Okay. So what they did, they came up with a frontage that's going to and then they narrowed it all the way back. To right. This. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when you when you do that, when you narrow the the access down, do, do, would you call that a bottleneck? Is there some type of terms of art? At that point, it's a private lane. Right. But I, it becomes yeah. a private lane. <laughs> but the only way that they could create that private lane and that flag lot was to make sure that that street frontage was subdividable in minimum lot frontage. And if they couldn't do that because there were too many other neighbors, then they wouldn't be permitted to create that black line. Well, and one of the other things that came out of our conversations today was is that there are significant concerns about public health safety because you've got to have emergency vehicles yeah. able to get down there, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, tabling is, is like the best idea. Green Street. And I, I did get a response from our uh, chief of fire, and he did not like the fact that he did Get his suggestions yeah. on that. I'll tell you a way to interpret that is if you have a road, you have to have minimum side yard setbacks from that property line. And if that minimum side yard setback is 25 feet, then that's the minimum lane width that you can allow because that's the only way for that lane to meet, that property line to meet that 25 foot setback. That's how you do that in a more rural area. Hmm. All right. Well, we look forward to having more information about that topic at the next meeting. Yeah. Um, anything else on agenda planning you want to talk about? Um, there was one thing you just I wrote um, down at the beginning that Mary and yeah. housing initiatives and planning commission involvement. Okay. So I'd like to develop something to bring. I can talk with Denise about timing, how much time we would have. Housing initiatives and motions involved. Here that is how much on the agenda plan. All right. Um, um, and just before you head out, um, if there are any written, any you want printed off for that work session, make sure it gets back to to me, to Denise, just anything you want at that table for that session. Okay. I'll make sure that I know. I'll get, it, get it for you. Do I have somewhere that you printed out all the uh, addendums for the conference? Well, I didn't. I gave it to you. You did. So I have them somewhere else. You guys want to hang on to all of them. They've got some things that Thank I'm going for you. It's some sycamore weeping somewhere. Yeah. Well, like a bunch of them all okay. together like this. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and if you don't have them, let me know and I'll make sure that you So how many of them do we have? I'm fine. How many? Oh, my God. I don't know. So I need to, I don't, I need to adjourn the meeting and we should have everything that's proposed in that, right? Okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So we move. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All in favor? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I do not know that. Right. Oh. <sighs>